Hello everyone and welcome back to the Dungeon Learner's Guide. Today we have another Commander's Guild deck tech. This is our 49th deck called Tokens Alone, Weak, Tokens Together, Strong. And since this is our 49th deck, I do want to give everyone a heads up. Our 50th deck is coming out next week and it's a bit special, pretty interesting. So I hope you're all excited for that. I know I am. But other than that, if you haven't seen this show before... What we are doing is randomly selecting a card from scryfall.com, working with a budget of $100 or less, and building a commander deck for Magic the Gathering around a theme of the chosen card. So before we get into the actual deck tech, I do want to take a quick moment to highlight some of our social media accounts, some of the ways that you can help support this channel. You can follow us over on Twitter, on Reddit. You can send us an email at dungeonlearnersguide at gmail.com. And if you're interested in helping support our content directly, you can go to our affiliate link at TCG Player. Any cards you buy using our link, we get a little bit of kickback from, so I do appreciate anyone who is willing to do that, because I know we're all buying cards here and there, so any little bit helps. And then if you'd like to support us even more directly, you can head over to our Patreon page. Both of those links are in the description below, but Patreon helps us kind of prepare for hopefully getting back into in-person commander in the future i'm hoping to use some of that money for equipment that i'll need to film in-person games hopefully get a better camera things like that so every little bit does help and if none of that is your style you can always just like the video subscribe to the channel that really does help out quite a bit and of course all of these places, including the comments of this video, is where we also take suggestions for future videos. So if there are any cards that you would like to see turned into a deck, then let us know. You can let us know through any of these means and in the comments, and I would be happy to turn those into a deck. But without any further ado, let's get into our actual deck this week. And in this case, we have a suggested card. And this one is coming from Marc Antoine Lavoie. I hope I pronounced that right. I apologize if I did not. And the suggested card is Marton Stromgald, which is two red red for a 1-1. One, one. It says summon legend, but I believe he is a human soldier now. If Marton Stromgald attacks, all other attacking creatures get plus X plus X until end of turn, where X is equal to the number of other attacking creatures. If Marton blocks... All other blocking creatures get plus X plus X until end of turn, where X is equal to the number of other blocking creatures. So essentially, if we attack with Marton and one other creature, that other creature is going to get plus one plus one because there is another attacking creature in Marton. Marton will never get the buff himself, unfortunately, so he is pretty weak to being blocked. He is just a 1-1 one -one after all. But that's the main idea behind what this card is wanting us to do. And of course, since we have a commander as our random card of the week, that means that the commander for this deck obviously has to also be that card. So Marton is going to be our commander. That means we are mono red this week. And we have a couple of major themes that kind of go throughout the course of this deck. And we're going to run through those really quickly. But the first of them is going to be tokens. Since Marton rewards us for attacking with a ton of creatures or blocking with a ton of creatures, we want to make sure that we, well, have a ton of creatures. So that's where cards like Tilanali Summoner come is in, which is one in a red for a 1-1 one, one human shaman. It has Ascend, so if we have 10 or more permanents, we get the city's blessing for the rest of the game. Whenever Tilanali Summoner attacks, you may pay X and a red. If you do, you create X-1-1 one, one red elemental creature tokens that are tapped and attacking, and at the beginning of the next end step, exile those tokens unless you have the city's blessing. So this is a great way to just start stacking up a bunch of tokens. It's incredibly easy to get to 10 permanents because this does count lands. So even on turn two, we already have three permanents on board. So swinging on turn three, we maybe play another land, get some tokens... We get the City's Blessing very, very quickly in this deck. And one nice thing about Tilanali Summoner, if you notice, it says that when it attacks, you may pay X and a red, and then those creatures come in tapped and attacking. Martan is a triggered ability as well. So we can actually stack this in a way that we attack with Tilanali Summoner and Martan, pay into the Summoner, create, we'll say, five 1-1 one, one elementals, 
Then Marton's ability triggers, and it sees that we now have five attacking elementals, plus the summoner, plus Marton, so all of our creatures would get plus five, plus five, which is much better than if we were just swinging with the summoner and Marton with no elementals. So Tilanali Summoner is a bit of an all-star in this deck. It's able to get us the tokens that we need, and it's able to kind of sneak them out right before combat, making the combat math a little bit harder for our opponents. And it's kind of just like having an onboard trick. But once we have all of our tokens, we need to make sure that they're actually doing damage. And the way we're going to do that is cards like Fist of Flame. Anything that gives trample is what we're looking for. So Fist of Flame is one in a red for an instant. It says draw a card. And then until end of turn, target creature gains trample and gets plus one plus O oh for each card you've drawn this turn. So if we're attacking with we'll say 11 creatures, they're all getting plus 10, plus 10, since there's 10 other attacking creatures, we need to make sure that they can't just be chumped by little 1-1 one, one tokens. We want to make sure that we're actually doing that damage. So Fists of Flame is great for that because it replaces itself, it cantrips, and it, again, makes the combat math very difficult for our opponents because they don't know if we're going to be able to trample over or not. So we can just put this on our biggest creature, do a ton of damage, and then, hopefully, win the game from there. But the trick to this deck, and I guess what you'd call a secret commander, is that we have cards like Zada Hedron Grinder in this deck. And Zada is 3 and a red for a goblin ally. It's a 3-3. Three, three. Whenever you cast an instant or sorcery spell that targets only Zada Hedron Grinder, copy that spell for each other creature you control that the spell could target, each copy targets a different one of those creatures. So this sounds kind of odd reading through it, but if we attack with 10 creatures, we can cast Fists of Flame on Zada, giving Zada plus 1 plus 0 oh, and trample until end of turn and drawing us a card. Zada will then copy Fists of Flame for every other creature we control, meaning not only are our creatures getting plus 10 plus 10 from Marton, they're getting plus one plus O, oh, since we've now drawn one card for the turn, and each of these is going to trigger separately, giving each creature an additional plus one plus O oh, as we keep drawing cards. We're drawing ten cards, because Fist of Flame lets us draw a card each time it resolves. And we're giving our entire team trample. So this is a massive blowout for our opponents, because they might see 10, 10, 10 creatures coming at them and think, oh, I've got 10 little 1-1s, one -ones. I can block all this damage, no problem. And then for 2 mana, we draw 10 cards, we give them all an additional plus 1, plus 0, plus 2, plus 3, plus 4, all the way up to 10, and they all get trample. This means that at any point, if we have Zada on board, we are able to pretty much scare our opponents into trying to block as much as possible because there's always going to be the chance that we can give our entire team trample give them all a massive pump to power to toughness to whatever and just win the game right there and zada is not the only creature in the deck that does what it does but it's one of the most efficient it's definitely the cheapest but there are some other ways in here to do the same thing so those are the major themes for this deck and I know I just talked up Zada quite a bit, but believe it or not, he's not actually one of our key cards in this deck. We do have three other cards that really take that spot instead. The first of which is Subira Tulzidi Caravaneer, which is a personal favorite card of mine. It's two and a red for a 2-3 human shaman. She has haste, and you can pay one mana, and another target creature with power two or less can't be blocked this turn. And you can pay one and a red and tap it, discard your hand until the end of turn whenever a creature you control with power two or less deals combat damage to a player draw a card so if we're ever low on cards we can attack with a ton of little tokens not with marton because he'll grow them outside of the range and then draw a bunch of cards but if we're looking to actually end the game we're past the point of drawing cards we're past the point of not swinging with marton we want to close out the game we can actually activate Subira on our tokens before we go to combat, or once we're in combat before Marton's ability triggers, make them unblockable, and then once Marton gives them plus 10, plus 10, or whatever he's going to give them, 
they're still unblockable because it doesn't matter that they're power two when they go to be blocked. It matters that they are power two or less when that ability resolves. So we can turn our little one one unblockable and then just turn it into a 10 10 and hit our opponent with it. And if we can manage to put that onto five, six, seven creatures, that can just win us the game right there. So Subira is very sneaky good in this deck, and a lot of people won't really see that coming. So it is important to make sure to protect her if you're planning on swinging out with the rest of the team. Our next key card is going to be Battle Him, which is one in a red for an instant that just says add red to your mana pool for each creature you control. Again, we want to be making a ton of tokens. So even if we just keep using our example of 10, we have 10 tokens on the board, we pay 2 mana, we get 10 red mana back. That lets us pretty much play out our entire hand. That lets us sink a bunch of mana into something like Subira, because it doesn't say that we have to use that to cast spells. We can just activate Subira 10 times, make our 10 one ones unblockable, swing, hit our opponents for... 100 damage because they're all going to get plus 10 plus 10 so battle him is phenomenal and it really helps us ramp into the late game and do things that our deck really should not be able to do and our final key card is morag fury of akum for red red for a legendary creature minotaur warrior it's a six six each creature you control gets plus one plus oh for each time it has attacked this turn and whenever a land enters the battlefield under your control, if it's your main phase, there's an additional combat phase after this phase, and at the beginning of that combat, you untap all creatures you control. So we've actually done a Morog deck on this channel before. If you're interested, the link should be at the top of the screen right now for you. But Morog is incredibly powerful because of the specific way that it's worded. It gives us an additional combat phase, which is great. Each creature you control gets plus one plus oh for each time it has attacked this turn. And that pairs super well with Martan, because Martan gives our creatures plus x plus x whenever we go and attack, and that buff stays until the end of turn. So if we're attacking and we're giving our creatures plus 10 plus 10, maybe they're unblockable with Subira, we hit our opponents, we play a land, we untap for our second combat step, our creatures still have that plus 10 plus 10, but when we go to combat for a second time, they're going to get another trigger from Martan, getting a total of plus 20 plus 20. They're still unblockable, thanks to Subira, and we're able to just keep hammering our opponents, and at that point, it's very difficult for us to not win the game unless our opponents have some sort of board wipe because we are going to hit them for a ton of damage almost out of nowhere. Because it's one thing to look at a board and see 10 one ones, and it's another thing to look at a board and see 10 30 30s. So, Morog, very powerful, being able to let us double up on Martan's ability and taking advantage of Subira's abilities because once something is unblockable for the turn, that doesn't matter when you switch to a separate combat step. So Morog, all-star, and again, if you have not seen our video on Morog before, please do check it out. It's very good. But with our key cards out of the way, let's take a look at some cool interactions in this deck because it's always nice to see how some pieces fit super well together. And the first interaction I want to take a look at is between Precursor Golem and Twin Flame. So Precursor Golem, 5 mana for a 3-3 three, three artifact creature Golem. When Precursor Golem enters the battlefield, put two 3-3 three, three colorless Golem artifact creature tokens onto the battlefield, and whenever a player casts an instant or sorcery spell that targets only a single Golem, that player copies that spell for each other Golem that spell could target. Each copy targets a different one of those Golems. So it kind of does what Zada does, but only for golems, which is fine because it brings along two friends when we play it. But if we partner that up with Twin Flame, which is one and a red, and it has Strive, but we're not going to use Strive here, otherwise this interaction is not going to work. And Strive says Twin Flame costs two and a red more to cast for each target beyond the first. But what it's going to do is it says choose any number of target creatures you control. For each of them, put a token that's a copy of that creature onto the battlefield. Those tokens have haste. Exile them at the beginning of the next end step. So if we have Precursor Golem and the two golems it comes with, 
we can cast Twin Flame targeting Precursor Golem, which is going to make a copy of Precursor Golem, but it's also going to target our other 3-3 three, three tokens. That allows us to make an additional Precursor Golem, which comes in with two more friends, and two additional 3-3 three, three Golems. So at the end of this, we would walk away with two Precursor Golems and four 3-3 three, three Golem creature tokens. Now, it is important to remember that whatever you target with Twin Flame, the token copy is going to get exiled at the end of turn, so you'll only have the four golems and two precursor golems during this turn, but they won't exile the copy's tokens. So you'll be able to keep the original precursor golem, the original golems that the original precursor golem made, and the two golems that the copy of precursor golem made, which I know is very confusing. But you'll be able to attack with eight golems on this turn, and then at the end of turn you have to exile four of them. You still get to keep the original precursor and its original tokens, plus the other two. Or I guess that's five. I'm not super great at math, unfortunately. But you get the idea. It can be very powerful and kind of a surprise for your opponents if you're able to pull this off. Now, our second cool interaction is going to be between Descent of the Dragons and Anax Hardened in the Forge. So Descent of the Dragons is four red red for a sorcery that says destroy any number of target creatures, and for each creature destroyed this way, its controller puts a 4-4 four, four red dragon creature token with flying onto the battlefield. So we're able to upgrade all of our little 1-1s one into 4-4s. Four, and that pairs incredibly well with Anax, Hardened in the Forge, which is one red-red for a legendary enchantment creature demigod. Anax's power is equal to your devotion to red, so he's a star three. And whenever Anax or another non-token creature you control dies, create a 1-1 one, one red satyr creature token with this creature can't block. If the creature had power four or greater, create two of those tokens instead. So we are able to pretty much destroy every creature we control, turning all of our little 1-1s one, and 2-2s two, into 4-4s, four, but if we're also destroying non-token creatures, so things like Anax, Subira, maybe even Martan, we're able to also make a 1-1 one, one red satyr for each creature destroyed. So we're able to walk away with a ton more tokens than we had before, and yeah, unfortunately they don't have haste, but we do have a ton of ways to grant haste in this deck. So hopefully, the real goal here is that we're able to turn our 1-1s one into a bunch of 4-4s four and immediately swing out hopefully winning the game, because if we don't win the game, Descent of the Dragons paints a pretty big target on our back, and then we would still have the Satyrs from Anax, but they can't block to save us, so it's a little bit tricky. So it's important to try to make sure you do this when you have a good chance at winning. But those are the cool interactions for the deck. And the last major piece of this is to take a look at the price. And this deck actually came in pretty cheap. It's $82.24, so it's almost $20 under our budget limit. And unsurprisingly, our most expensive card is Martan himself. But it feels kind of cheating for me to say, hey, this is the most expensive card because we built the whole deck around it. So instead, we're going to take a look at the second most expensive card, which is Embercleave. And Embercleave is four red red for a legendary artifact equipment. It has flash, and this spell costs one less to cast for each attacking creature you control. When it enters the battlefield, attach it to target creature you control. And equipped creature gets plus one plus one and has double strike and trample, and it can also equip for three. Because we're making so many tokens, it's really not difficult to attack with four creatures, meaning that Embercleave will only cost red red. And it doesn't seem super great. Plus one, plus one, double strike, trample is all very good, but it's still just kind of a combat trick. But when we're talking about the fact that our creatures are getting absolutely massive with Martan, double strike and trample is incredibly dangerous. Being able to go from, we'll say, a 9-9 nine -nine to a 10-10 double strike trample means that it's the difference between doing 9 damage and 20 damage. So Embercleave really puts in a lot of work. And yes, combat tricks aren't that effective in Commander, but because it stays on the board, because nobody really expects it, it's very rare for people to be expecting the Embercleave. It can kind of just get people out of nowhere. So I do really like this card in this deck. It is $5, so it is pretty expensive. 
And if you're looking to trim down the price, it's very easy to replace this with just another combat trick. But if you have one or you don't mind spending the $5 for it, it is an amazing include. On the other hand, if you're maybe looking to increase the price of the deck, you're like, oh, $82 is good, but why don't we why don't we pump it up a little bit, right? If you're looking to do that, we do have some out-of-budget upgrades that I would recommend for this deck. The first of which is Skull Clamp, which is one mana for an artifact equipment. Equipped creature gets plus one, minus one, and whenever equipped creature dies, draw two cards, and it equips for one. Since we're making so many little 1-1 one, one tokens in this deck, Skull Clamp is essentially just pay one mana, draw two cards, sacrifice a creature, which is perfect. We don't need 30 tokens. We could probably still kill someone with 20, so we spend 10 mana, draw 20 cards, and at that point, it's not much that our opponents could do to stop us. So Skull Clamp is a phenomenal include if you have the budget for it, and honestly, I could have fit it into our original budget, but I kind of like the idea of it being $20 under our budget limit, so I decided not to include it for this one. Our second out-of-budget upgrade, though, definitely would not fit into our budget this week, and that is Perforos, God of the Forge. Perforos is 3 and a red for a legendary enchantment creature god. He's a 6-5 with indestructible, and as long as our devotion to red is less than 5, Perforos isn't a creature. And whenever another creature enters the battlefield under your control, Perforos deals 2 damage to each opponent, and you can also pay 3 and creatures you control get plus 1 plus 0 until end of turn. That last ability is not super relevant, because if we're making 10 tokens, I know I keep using 10 as the number, I like it, it's just a nice round number, but if we're making 10 tokens... We're doing 20 damage to each opponent with Perforos on the board. And it's not difficult for us to be able to make 10 tokens in one go. We have Tilanali Summoner, we have Descent of the Dragons, we have Anax. There are a ton of ways that we can just flood the board in one turn, do a whole bunch of damage with Perforos, and if that's not enough to win us the game, then we attack, Martan pumps the team, and we just win anyway. So Perforos is a phenomenal include if you can, but because it is such a phenomenal include, it makes sense that it is a $20 card. So out of our budget limit, but definitely a cool card to think about. So that is our deck for this week. And the last piece of this is to actually see how our deck performs in a game. So we are going to jump into a game with three opponents. And in this case, we are playing against Ure, playing his Emil the Blessed deck. Vin, who's playing his Queen Marchesa deck and Chief, who is playing Adeline Resplendent Cathar. So, Ure's Emil deck is a Selesnia Blink deck. He's got a bunch of Enter the Battlefield effects. He's got a lot of plus one, plus one counter synergies. And I think there's a minor unicorn sub-theme in there as well. So he wants to kind of get a ton of value out of creatures entering the battlefield, triggering their abilities, and then using his commander to exile them and return them to play, getting to use their abilities again. So I think in the long run, that's probably the deck to watch out for. I think that he's going to be able to grind out some value and slowly win if given the chance. Um, we'll cut all this. Hang on. Just adjusting. <clears throat> okay. Vin's Queen Marchesa deck is very much a almost a control deck. He wants to play a bunch of cards that grant him the monarchy. He can draw a bunch of cards. And then being able to use his little assassin tokens and Queen Marchesa and some other taxing pieces to slowly grind out the victory and kind of run over his opponents, being able to get more cards than them to the point where there's really nothing they can do. So I am interested to see how we match up against Queen Marchesa because I think if we're faster... We can kind of run them over, but the fact that the assassins have death touch means that they trade very well with our 10-10 creatures, so I am a little concerned about that deck. And then finally, the person at the table who is competing with us for aggressive styles is Chief's Adeline Resplendent Cathar deck, which wants to make just a ton of creatures. And I haven't played against Chief's deck in particular, but I've played against other Adelines in the past. And since Adeline makes a 1-1 human for each opponent, 
Adeline can get a massive board state very, very quickly. So I am a little concerned that they're going to outpace us and make a lot more tokens than we do, but I am hopeful that we are still able to have a bigger board than Adeline. So if our 10 tokens are going against their 20 tokens, I think that if our 10 tokens are 10 tens, they're still going to match up pretty well against 21 ones. So that's my main hope. I don't know if that's how it's going to go. But this is going to be our game for the week. Uh, I'm excited to see how it goes. I hope you guys are as well. And let me know what you all think when it's over, but I'll talk to you all once it's done. At the start of the game, Ure goes first, followed by Vin, myself, and then Chief. On Ure's first turn, he plays a Temple Garden tapped. Vin plays a Myriad Landscape. I play a Mountain. Chief plays a Plains and then casts Paladin class, making spells his opponents cast on his turn cost one more to cast. Ure plays a Plains, and casts Druid class, which gains him a life whenever a land enters under his control. Vin plays a Battlefield Forge, and casts Soul Ring, which he uses to sacrifice his Myriad Landscape, searching his library for two swamps, and putting them into play tapped. I play a Field of Ruin, and then cast Tilanali's Summoner, which allows me to make a 1-1 elemental token for each mana I pay when it attacks. Chief plays a Plains, and casts Mother of Runes, which can tap to give target creature protection from the color of his choice until end of turn, and he then casts a Commander's Plate. Ure plays a Plains, gaining a life and then levels up Druid class, allowing him to play an additional land on each of his turns, which he immediately does, playing a Thriving Grove naming White so that it taps for both of his colors. Vin plays a Plains, and casts his commander, Queen Marchesa, becoming the Monarch. And since she has haste, he moves to combat and attacks Chief for 3. Then in his end step, he draws for being the Monarch. On my turn, I play a Mountain, and then I attack Vin for 1 with Tilanali's Summoner, becoming the Monarch, and also paying 3 mana to create two 1-1 one, one Elementals that are attacking Ure. Then at the beginning of my end step, I exile the Elementals since I don't yet have the City's Blessing, and draw a card for being the Monarch. Chief plays a Plains, and then casts his commander, Adeline Resplendent Cathar, which has power equal to the number of creatures he controls, and also makes a 1-1 human token that's tapped and attacking for each opponent whenever Chief attacks. Ure casts a Territorial Scythe Claw, which gets plus one plus one counter whenever he plays a land, and then he immediately plays a Plains and Forest, gaining two life and putting two counters on the Scythe Cat. After that, he casts a Tempered Veteran, which can be activated to put a plus one plus one counter on target creature. In Vin's upkeep, he creates a 1-1 Assassin token with Death Touch, since he's no longer the Monarch, and then casts Talisman of Indulgence. After that, he plays a Plains, and casts Fighter Class, leaving me as the only classless player at the table, and this allows him to search his library for an equipment, putting it to hand. This has him putting Skull Clamp into his hand, which he then immediately casts. After that, he moves to combat and decides to attack me for 1, regaining the monarchy, and Chief for 3 with his commander Marchesa. Chief blocks with Adeline, giving her protection from black, negating the damage. Then in his second main phase, Vin equips Skull Clamp to his assassin token, killing it and drawing 2 cards. Then at the end of turn, he draws another card for being the monarch. On my turn, I play a Rogue's Passage and cast my commander, Marton Stromgald. Chief casts an Archaeomancer's Map, searching his library for two basic planes and putting them to hand. This also lets him put a land into play whenever an opponent puts a land into play. He then plays a planes and moves to combat, attacking Vin with Adeline, triggering her and putting three 1-1 human tokens tapped and attacking each of his opponents. 
Ure blocks and kills one, then I take one damage and Vin takes six, giving up the monarchy to Chief, who draws a card from it at the end of turn. Ure casts Colossal Majesty, letting him draw a card on his upkeep if he controls a creature with power 4 or greater, and then cast Reclamation Sage, destroying the Skull Clamp when it enters. In Vin's upkeep, he makes an Assassin token since he's not the Monarch, and then in his main phase he plays a Mountain, which allows Chief to put a Plains into play, and he casts Ghostly Prison forcing his opponents to pay 2 mana for each creature that attacks him. After that, he levels up his fighter class, making the first equip ability he activates each turn cost 2 less. Moving to combat, he decides to attack Ure for 3 with Marchesa, and 1 with the Assassin token. On my turn I play a Mountain, and cast Mirror Wing Dragon which copies any spell that targets it for each other creature the caster controls. Then at the end of my turn, Vin casts Chaos Warp, targeting Mother of Runes. Unfortunately for him, Chief activates it to give itself protection from red, fizzling the spell. On Chief's turn, he plays an Ancient Tomb, and then equips Adeline with the Commander's Plate giving her plus 3 plus 3 and protection from every color except white. He then moves to combat, attacking Vin with Adeline, paying 2 for the Ghostly Prison, and creating 3 more human tokens that are attacking each of his opponents. Ure and I both block, killing 2 humans, and then Vin takes 11 damage. Then, at the end of Chief's turn, he draws for being the Monarch again. In Ure's upkeep, he draws a card with Colossal Majesty, and then plays two planes thanks to Druid class, putting two plus one plus one counters on Territorial Scythe Cat, and this also allows Chief to put a Plains and Cavern of Souls into play, naming humans. After that, Ure casts his commander, Emil the Blessed and then he uses his creatures to convoke a March of the Multitudes, where X equals 5, creating 5 1-1 one, one soldier tokens with lifelink. In Vin's upkeep, he makes another Assassin token, since he is still not the Monarch, and then plays a Terramorphic Expanse, sacrificing it to search his library and put a Plains into play tapped. After that, he casts Carder Doom Scourge, goading each of his opponent's creatures, and also draining each opponent for one whenever an attacking creature dies. On my turn, since I'm forced to attack, I attack Ure with Martan and Chief with Mirrorwing and Tilanali's Summoner. On attacks, I pay three mana into the Summoner, making two elementals that are also attacking Chief. Then, Martan's trigger resolves, giving all my other creatures plus 4 plus 4. Ure blocks Martan with a soldier token, while Chief blocks everything except Mirrorwing with his humans and Adeline. Still before damage, I cast Run Amuck on Mirrorwing Dragon to give it plus 3 plus 3 and trample until end of turn, and this spell is copied for all my other creatures as well, giving my entire team plus 3 plus 3 and trample. Then damage happens, and Ure takes 2, while Chief takes 26 and I reclaim the monarchy. This also kills one of Ure's soldiers, two of Chief's humans, and my summoner, draining all of Vin's opponents for one, but I do get the city's blessing so I get to keep the elementals, and I draw for monarchy at the end of my turn. On Chief's turn, he casts his own Skull Clamp, and then equips the Skull Clamp to a human token, killing it and drawing two cards. After that, he casts Elish Norn Grand Cenobite, giving all his creatures plus 2 plus 2, and all his opponent's creatures minus 2 minus 2, killing most of the creatures on the board. After that, since he also has to attack, he attacks me with Mother of Runes and Adeline, triggering Adeline and creating 3 human tokens attacking each of his opponents. Then Ure and Vin take 3 each, while I take 17 damage and Chief becomes the Monarch yet again. 
On Ure's turn, he plays a Plains, putting a counter on Scythe Claw and gaining a life. He then levels up Druid Class, turning one of his Plains into an 8-8 creature since he controls 8 lands, and before Ure goes to combat, Vin casts Generous Gift to destroy Adeline and create a 3-3 Elephant token under Chief's control. However, in response, Chief casts a Flawless Maneuver to give his creatures indestructible, meaning he gets to keep his commander and still gets the Elephant token. With Chief very well defended, Ure decides to attack me for 5 since his creatures are still goaded. On Vin's turn, he plays a Mountain, and then casts Ruinous Ultimatum, destroying all of his opponent's non-land permanents. Once that resolves, he moves to combat and can safely attack Chief for 4 and me for 3 with Marchesa, reclaiming the monarchy and drawing for it at the end of turn. I play a Mountain and cast Scampering Scorcher, creating two 1-1 elemental tokens when it enters, and I follow that up by casting Forbidden Friendship, creating a 1-1 dinosaur token and a 1-1 human token. Chief casts a Welcoming Vampire, drawing a card once a turn whenever a creature with power 2 or less enters under his control, and a Mentor of the Meek, allowing him to pay a mana when a creature with power 2 or less enters under his control to draw a card, and this triggers the Vampire, drawing him a card. He then plays a Homeward Path as his land for turn, and casts a Scroll Rack. Ure plays a forest, gaining a life, and then recasts his commander, Emil. He moves to combat, attacking Vin for 9 with his land creature, paying 2 for the ghostly prison, becoming the monarch, and then drawing for it at the end of turn. In Vin's upkeep, he makes another assassin token, since he's not the monarch, and then plays a foreboding ruins, and casts a Chroma's Will, giving his entire team flying, vigilance, double strike, lifelink, indestructible, and protection from all colors until the end of turn. This allows him to attack Ure for 16 damage, gaining Vin 16 life and becoming the monarch again. Then in his second main phase, he casts a Court of Grace, allowing him to make a 4-4 Angel token in his upkeep if he's the Monarch, and a 1-1 Spirit token if he's not. On my turn, I play a Mountain, and recast my commander, Marton Stromgald. Chief casts a Skyclave Cleric, exiling Court of Grace and drawing two cards with Welcoming Vampire and Mentor of the Meek. He then plays a Plains, and recasts his commander, Adeline. Ure casts a Good Fortune Unicorn, which puts a plus one plus one counter on his other creatures when they enter the battlefield, and he also pays two with Emil to put two plus one plus one counters on it when it enters, since it's a unicorn. He follows that up with a Wildwood Scourge for X equals five, so it comes in with six total counters. Vin casts a Chroma, Vision of Ixidor, giving all his creatures plus one plus one for each major keyword they have at the beginning of combat, and he moves to combat, triggering a Chroma, and attacking Ure for three, and Chief for five with Marchesa. Chief blocks with his Skyclave Apparition, making Vin a 4-4 spirit token when it dies, while Ure takes the three. Luckily for Vin, Chief is even willing to give him the token he needs. On my turn, I play a Goblin War Party, making three 1-1 Goblin Tokens. And then I cast Zada Hedron Grinder, which copies any spell I cast that targets only Zada for each other creature I control, with the new copies targeting those creatures. On Chief's turn, he activates Scroll Rack, exchanging five cards in his hand with the five cards on top of his library, and then plays Nykthos Shrine to Nyx, and casts Sarah Ascendant, which is currently just a 1-1 with lifelink, drawing two cards when it enters. After that, he casts a Grand Abolisher, preventing his opponents from casting spells or activating abilities on his turn, drawing a card with Mentor of the Meek. Finally, he casts Generous Gift, destroying a Chroma, making Vin a 3-3 Elephant token. 
and still not done with his turn, casts Anointed Procession, doubling the tokens he creates with any of his effects. Ure casts a Branching Evolution, doubling the amount of plus one plus one counters he puts on his creatures, and in response, Vin casts Boros Charm to do four damage to Chief, knocking him out of the game. After that, Ure activates a meal, exiling Good Fortune Unicorn and returning it to play, paying one mana to put two plus one plus one counters on it, which is doubled to four. This also puts two counters on the Scourge. Vin casts Gisela, Blade of Gold Knight, doubling the damage his opponents and their permanents take, while halving the damage Vin and his permanents take. He then attacks Ure with Marchesa and an Assassin token for 8 total damage, and then draws for being the Monarch at the end of turn. I play a Desert of the Fervent, and attack Vin with 3 goblins, paying 6 for Ghostly Prison, and Ure with my 7 other creatures. This triggers Martan and gives all my creatures plus 9 plus 9 until the end of turn. Ure blocks 4 creatures and exiles his Good Fortune Unicorn, returning it to play before damage happens, while Vin blocks 2. This has Ure still taking 42 damage, getting knocked out of the game, and Vin only takes 5, giving me back the Monarchy. Then in my second main phase, in an attempt to still survive Vin's next turn, I cast Blasphemous Act, doing 13 damage to all creatures and wiping the board. Then at the end of my turn, I draw for being the Monarch. Vin plays a Rugged Prairie, and recasts Marchesa, moving to combat and attacking me for 3 since she has haste, becoming Monarch yet again. In his second main phase, he casts Kambal Consul of Allocation, which does 2 damage to an opponent when they cast a non-creature spell and gains Vin 2 life. At the end of turn, he draws for being the Monarch. On my turn, I cast Burn Down the House, doing 5 damage to each creature, killing both of Vin's creatures. This also has me losing 2 life while he gains 2 life thanks to Kambal. After that, I cast an Oketra's Monument, which makes my white creatures cost one less, which is completely irrelevant in this deck, but it also creates a 1-1 warrior token whenever I cast a creature. Vin once again recasts Queen Marchesa and attacks me for three. In his second main phase, he plays a castle Loch Thwain and then draws for being the Monarch. On my turn, I recast my commander, Martan, creating a 1-1 warrior token with Oketra's Monument. Vin plays a Plains, and casts Windborn Muse, making me pay 2 more to attack him, and then attacks me with Queen Marchesa, but I block with my warrior, killing the token. On my turn, I cast Chaos Warp, targeting my own Oketra's Monument to shuffle it into my library, revealing the top card and putting it into play if it's a permanent. This lets me put Morog, Fury of Akum into play, and after that I cast Perforos Bronze Blooded, giving all of my creatures haste, but I can't pay to attack, so I pass. Vin casts an Esper Sentinel, allowing him to draw a card when I cast my first non-creature spell each turn unless I pay 1, and then attacks me for 2 in the air with Windborn Muse. In his second main phase, he casts Dam to destroy Morog and deactivate my Perforos. On my turn, I play a Mountain, and knowing I'm dead on Vin's next turn, I cast Distemper of the Blood, giving Martan plus 2 plus 2 and Trample until end of turn, paying 1 for the Esper Sentinel, and then I activate Rogue's Passage, making Martan unblockable, and then I pass since I can't pay for the tax effects. This allows Vin to untap and attack me with Windborn Muse on his turn, winning Vin the game. Alright, so that was a super sweet game. A big thank you to Ure, Chief, and Vin. Um, I know that everyone's deck really did some powerful things. I think we were a bit scared by Chief in the very beginning because he got a massive board state very quickly. And I think that allowed us to overlook Vin a little bit as he started to set up. And unfortunately for our deck, once the Ghostly Prison and the Windborn Muse were on the board, there really wasn't much we could do. We can't afford to pay four mana for every single token that attacks. And even if we could pay for one, maybe two, 
there's still just one ones and two twos. So once that happened, there wasn't much we could do, but we still tried. And then I think Ure's deck also did a very good job showing off how strong the landfall synergies could be. I wasn't expecting him to have the landfall style of the deck, but it was super cool to see. And um, hopefully I'm able to play with these guys again. I think it was a very good game. But thank you everybody for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, as always, please do like and subscribe to the channel. It does help out a lot. But other than all of that, I will see you all on the other side of the Dungeon Learner's Guide.